Hello, my name's Julian Edgar, and I'm the author of this book, Vehicle Aerodynamics, Testing, Modification and Development. And the book is aimed at those modifying their road cars, their racing cars, or developing alternative transport. Over the last few videos, we've looked at how you can measure whether a vehicle is developing aerodynamic lift or aerodynamic downforce. And we've covered some different techniques. What I want to do in this video is summarize those techniques and summarize their advantages and their disadvantages. Let's take a look firstly in brief at those different techniques. The first technique was to measure suspension ride height. If your car is developing lift, as you go faster, the average ride height increases as the car's bodywork gets lifted on the suspension. Conversely, if your car develops downforce, the car will be pushed downwards, the body will be pushed downwards on the springs as you go faster. So if we fit a sensor to the suspension that can measure ride height, and then if we average that ride height electronically, we can see if the ride height is getting bigger or smaller as we go faster, and so we can work out if our vehicle is developing lift or downforce. That was the first technique that we covered. The second technique we covered was to again measure ride height, but this time to use a laser sensor attached to the car's bodywork pointing down to the ground. The idea is much the same as it is with suspension ride height sensor. If your car is developing lift as you go faster, the ride height will increase. And in this case, the laser sensor will get further from the ground. You might remember if you watched that video, there is a problem there though, and that is the tires get bigger. They grow in diameter as you go faster. So you've got more than one thing happening at once. The third approach we took works only on fastback, cars with sloping rear backs, or modern notchback, modern three box vehicles that again have very sloping rear windows and so are very close to a fastback in shape. And the technique was this. We looked at the direction at which the trailing vortices being shed behind the car were rotating. And the direction of their rotation tells us if the vehicle as a whole is developing lift or downforce on those vehicle types only, remember. So it's an interesting approach. We used a paddle, a rotating paddle that's suspended, pushed out the back of the car, and the direction of rotation of that paddle shows which direction that particular vortex is rotating in. The third approach is to measure pressures, aerodynamic pressures that are acting on the bodywork. Look at how big an area each of those pressures is acting on, and then work out if we have a lower pressure overall on top than we do under the car. If we do, the car will develop lift, or a higher pressure overall on top of the car than underneath. In that case, the car will develop downforce. So there were those different techniques. Let's now summarize the advantages and disadvantages of each, and then I'll give you my preferred technique to use. So using a ride height suspension center, a set sensor, a pot on the sensor, it's low in cost. The uh, sensors that I buy are from Range Rovers. They typically cost me $30, $40 each. Um, you need only one if you want to measure one end of a car at a time. Uh, if you wanted to buy four and have them permanently attached so you could measure front and rear uh, lift or downforce, then you could do that as well. But uh, anyway, they're, they're low in cost. They might be low in cost, but they are very accurate. These are linear sensors. They are analog linear sensors, which means they can vary, uh, measure very, very small variations in height, and they can do it quite accurately. The smoothing circuit takes away all the oscillations of bumps on the road, and you simply measure the output of that smoothing circuit with a, a multimeter. Uh, very, very accurate way of doing it. Using suspension ride height sensors, you can also quantify the amount of downforce or lift you are getting. Basically, you measure the change in ride height, you take away the aerodynamic addition that was causing that improvement, and then you achieve the same effect by putting weights in the car and going at the same speed. So you can actually quantify, oh, I've got 10 kilograms front downforce at 100 kilometers an hour, or whatever it might be. If you are dealing with lift, well, you'd load the car to start with, and then you could take those weights out. However, 
Ride height suspension sensors are fiddly to fit. It's easy to underestimate this, but I, I want you to really take that on board. You need rigid brackets, you need bull joint links that have no slop in them. You need to move the pot through most of its travel as the suspension moves through most of its travel. It can take them quite setting up to do it. It's not the sort of thing you just do on a mate's car in half an hour or something like that. It t typically takes me, I don't know, three, four hours to, to fit one, but then I'm a pretty slow worker, but you know, the results, the results pay for themselves. But it is a, a process that's a bit fiddly. You do need an electronic smoothing circuit. Look, it's very, very simple. It's a couple of capacitors, a couple of resistors, you know, total parts cost maybe a dollar or two. You need a five volt regulated supply, but a, a good phone charger will provide that. Just check it doesn't vary in, in voltage with uh, alternator RPM or electrical loads. But you do need a little bit of electronics to be able to get a nice smoothed output. You cannot measure directly out of the pot sensor. The, the value is just jumping all over the place. You do need an averaging technique. I choose to use an analog averaging technique, but uh, if you're good with the uh, Arduino or any microcontroller board, you could use a sampling technique and, and average it in the software. If you have a motorsport dashboard, say on a competition car, you can average the, the input in the software and get the same sort of result. Right height suspension sensors to measure lift and down for force work best on cars with soft suspension. You want the springs to be soft enough that the body height does clearly change with lift or down force. And if you're dealing with cars with really, really stiff suspension, you know, a person gets into the car and the suspension barely moves. Well, if that person weighs 60 or 70 or 80 kilograms, you know, you're not going to be able to measure downforce or lift of 60 or 70 or 80 kilograms if the suspension's not moving with that sort of load on board. If you have a car with stiffer suspension, you just go faster. Um, but obviously, if you're, you're measuring a road car and you, you live in a country with speed limits, that does become a bit problematic. The other approach, especially on a competition car, is just to swap in some softer suspension, some softer springs while you're doing the testing. The testing's done in a straight line, so there's no problems with going around corners or anything like that. But that still remains a disadvantage of this approach. Laser ride height sensors, a different set of advantages and disadvantages. Firstly, it's expensive to get a laser sensor of sufficient resolution and quality, and furthermore, one that will work with a moving surface, a moving road, you're gonna to have to pay real money. Now, lots of people write to me and say, oh, what about an ultrasonic sensor? Or I found a really cheap laser sensor. I, I couldn't make any of those work. I tried using uh, cheaper approaches. Uh, the, the ultrasonic sensor, for example, um, I, I couldn't get accuracy of less than, you know, better than three or four millimeters. And uh, often when we're using right height sensing to, uh, to measure lift and downforce, we want averages of only half a millimeter, two millimeters, one millimeter difference. So if the sensor's all over the place, and one ultrasonic sensor I, I trialed, um, even with the ride height unchanging, it was showing variations of plus or minus four millimeters. And, and that will be hopeless. That just won't achieve what you want. So the sensor is expensive. However, it's quick to fit. You basically make a bracket, suction cap it to the side of the car with a good quality suction cap. You don't want it falling off. Helps if you can adjust its angle, so it makes some adjusting bolts and screws. But, you know, like fitting one of these can take a minute. You can use this to quantify kilograms of lift or downforce, uh, as we did with the ride height sensor. To, to get a, over the problem of tires growing, you always do the testing with and without the aerodynamic addition and at the same speed. So you do 100 kilometers an hour and have the wing on, what's the ride height? You take the wing off, you do 100 kilometers an hour, what's the ride height now? So because you're doing an AB comparison of that sort, uh, the tyre growth is the same in each uh, case, so it cancels out. The uh, laser ride height sensor needs an electronic smoothing circuit. In the book, I use a slightly different one uh, to the, uh, the suspension ride height pots. Um, again, you must have a smoothing circuit uh, because otherwise the, the output's just juggling, juggling, dancing all over the place. And in fact, this one dances even more than the suspension ride height sensor because the resolution of this laser sensor is enough to read the, the, the shape of the bitumen, to, to actually measure the coarseness of the bitumen. Again, it works best on cars with soft suspension, or you need to go really fast, or you need to swap in temporarily softer springs because we want to see a change in ride height with aerodynamic lift or downforce. 
trailing vortices, measuring the direction of swirls coming off the back of fastback or notchback vehicles. Here's an example of the uh, paddle system that I built uh, to measure the action of trailing vortices. It works only on those cars, fastbacks and, and modern notchbacks. You need to have a nice sloping tail to the vehicle and that's the sort of shape that develops these trailing vortices. It requires building uh, and mounting a rotating paddle system. Uh, as I think I said previously, I found the, ro the, the mounting of the rotating system the most complex part. I uh, ended up using a, a suction cap and ram ball joint uh, mount to, to be able to fit it to different cars. It needs to be rigid, you don't want it falling off. It needs to be able to be moved laterally so you can position it in one of those trailing vortices. It needs to be far enough behind the car and that makes it all a bit tricky. The approach shown here can show lift or downforce changes of movable aero elements like spoilers. Now, you could argue the other ones can as well, the other techniques, but this one's particularly interesting where you change the whole lift or downforce aspect of the car and you can actually watch the uh, paddle change direction. So if you have a, a button to deploy a rear spoiler, which is very effective, you can actually watch the, the paddle slow its rotation in one direction, come to a halt, and then rotate in the other direction as that spoiler is deployed. So that's quite an amazing aspect of this particular approach. It requires no electronics. Um, the, the paddle that I've shown here does have an electronic tachometer built into it to measure rotational speed. But if you just want to look at the direction of rotation, which is enough for lift downforce uh, ascertain, ascertaining, then you, you don't need any electronics at all. And it can be done with cars uh, with stiff suspension. You're not changing ride height. You're not looking at that, so it doesn't matter. And you can do it at relatively slow speeds. Interestingly enough, um, on at least one car I've tested, at slow speeds, really slow speeds, 30 kilometres an hour, the car develops lift. And as you go faster, the rotational direction of the paddle changes because the car is developing downforce. And I assume because that car gets so much of its downforce from the airflow under the car, I assume at slow speeds, simply not enough airflow is going under the car to create that downforce. So when I say slow speeds, you still need to do 60 or 70 kilometres an hour, not, not a walking pace or anything like that. The final method is measuring lift or downforce through pressure measurement. Now, you will only get an approximate result. Uh, I mean, you could get more accurate if you measure pressures all over the car, underneath and on top, and then work out the areas the pressures are acting on and work out the vertical component of that, that force direction and so on. You'd get very accurate, but it would take you forever and better to use one of the other techniques that's been described in this video. Um, but you, measuring pressures and working out if there's an overall lower pressure on top than underneath, in which case there'd be lift or vice versa, in which case there'd be downforce. It can be done at relatively low speeds and it can be done on cars with stiff suspension. But you would normally do this sort of, of, of measurement as part of a broader measurement process you're already doing. So you might be doing uh, pressure measuring to see if an under tray is working or something like that. And in that situation, you'd measure not only the under tray pressures, but you'd also measure the center line pressures across the top of the car. So you'd be able to get a better feel for what was going on overall. But as I say, you would normally check, is there downforce or is there lift as part of a broader measuring process that you're already doing? It can give approximate lift downforce forces. If you actually calculate the pressures, calculate the areas, calculate the forces that are then involved in newtons and then convert that to kilograms force, you can get a feel for how many kilograms force lift or downforce am I likely to be getting. But it's, it's usually better to say how much lift force is the roof giving me, for example. And you might find the roof at 150 kilometres an hour is developing, just the roof alone is developing, you know, 30 kilograms of lift or something of that sort. So it's, it's a good way of um, quantifying the, the, the forces that are acting on the different areas. Um, but you can do it for the whole car, the whole of the top and the whole of the bottom. Requires no electronics, no smoothing circuit, but you must be measuring pressures. And uh, uh, the, the pressure measurement shown here was done with an EvoScan P16A uh, scanner, um, but which is an expensive piece of commercial gear. But you can do it very cheaply with techniques that have been covered in the book, well under 100 US dollars to measure aerodynamic pressures anywhere you want on your car. So overall, 
I suggest you take this approach. Outside a full-size wind tunnel, ride height suspension sensors are the cheapest and most accurate way of assessing overall lift or downforce and then front lift or downforce or rear lift and downforce. Now, you can use one sensor and just move it front to rear. You can have multiple sensors fitted all the time. That's up to you. You may have to fit softer springs while you're doing the testing, but at least you get an extremely accurate result. It takes into account all of the pressures acting on the bodywork. You don't have to measure them all individually. This automatically takes all the pressures acting on the bodywork. And in my experience, my direct experience of using all the techniques that I've covered in this video, this gives the best results. As a bonus, it's almost the, the cheapest as well. So that's the approach that I recommend you take using suspension ride height sensors, potentiometer based ones with a, a simple voltage output that you then smooth. All in my book, covered in a lot more detail than in a video like this. I used to say to people, one video like this is about one paragraph in a book. And this is 170,000 words of book, 500 pages. 800 images. It's available from Amazon in your country. It's not a cheap book, but I think you'll save the purchase price of the book in the very first aerodynamic modification that you make that actually works. Thank you.